in verse 24. Deuteronomy 31 and 24. So it was when Moses had completed writing the words of this law in a book when they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. If today, while I am yet alive with you, you've been rebellious against the Lord, then how much more after my death? Gather to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their hearing, and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you will become utterly corrupt, and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. Now, Rabbi Zacharias used to be fond of quoting a political thinker of a couple centuries ago who said, let me write a nation's songs and I do not care who makes its laws. There was a person named Fletcher I'm not familiar with this thinker other than Robbie's quotation. But it makes a good point about the power of song, about how influential it is. And we can say memorable it is. When I was in Jerusalem, we were given the choice in our Hebrew class of memorizing one or two different psalms. And the Hebrew prof gave us our choice. We could pick either one. Well, Psalm 121 was one of the choices, and I have always enjoyed Michael Card's music, and Psalm 121 happens to be a song that he recorded, not only in English, but in Hebrew. So he sings the psalm a cappella in Hebrew, and then sings it a cappella in English. Well, there was a guy in my class who was not very gifted in languages and really struggled to memorize. And yet, he was an excellent singer. I said to him, well, you know, Michael Card has made this into a song, don't you? And he said, no, I don't know it. And so I taught it to him. And he passed that quiz with flying colors. He was able to do it. Because when you put it to music, even though he didn't know all the meanings of the words, he could repeat that, you know, quite easily. And there's certain songs maybe that you've heard before that have large parts of it in other languages, and yet you can uh, recapitulate that because the tune gets in your head. I don't want to do it to you, but like, for example, the Macarena, you know? Anyway, <laughs> but anyway, or O Sole Mio or something like that, you know? There's all kinds of songs, and they're very easy to remember, uh, or more easy, let's say, than trying to memorize just a piece of prose, a, a paragraph of something. And it's one of the beautiful things about music is you can retain it for many years. I remember a good brother now with the Lord telling me about visiting his mother in the nursing home. and She was fully gone into Alzheimer's disease. But he said the interesting thing is she can't remember anything else, but she remembers the Sunday school songs that she learned in Sunday school, and she remembers the hymns, and she remembers verses. So he said, we go and we sing with her, and she sings right along and knows all the words. And we quote the scripture, and she quotes it right along with us. And it brings to your mind very easily, when something is in song, it's easy to, or easier, shall we say, to bring that out of your memory and into your mouth. And so this is really a stroke of divine genius for Moses to take his swan song from the nation and leave them this song that they were going to learn. And Moses is pretty blunt about not being unrealistic about how obedient they were going to be. He says, if you've been rebellious while I'm alive, what are you going to be like after I'm dead? And yet, although that paragraph sounds very down and very dour and very 
pessimistic, it's actually realistic, but the optimistic part comes in the fact that if it was all doom and gloom and they were just going to go from bad to worse and suffer the judgment and be destroyed, then what's the point of teaching them a song? Well, somebody could say, well, God once recorded against them that they knew the truth. I mean, that they can't stand up and say one day, we didn't know. That this song is evidence that they knew God's ways. They knew God's grace. They knew what God had been, done for them. They knew the blessings and they knew the curses. It's all here in the song. But the beautiful thing is that's not all the song is. Because the song ends on a note of triumph. So obviously, in leaving them the song, the concept here is, yes, you're going to rebel. Yes, God's going to have to deal with you. Yes, there are many hard times ahead for Israel. Even as Brother Rich reminded us, the time that Jeremiah calls the time of Jacob's trouble, or what we call in New Testament terms, the tribulation. And yet, there's going to be that recovery. There's going to be that remembrance. There's going to be that turning again to the Lord. Hence the song. And in a book that's all about judgment, and I speak now of Revelation, it's very interesting that Revelation 15, when it comes to the culmination of God's wrath being poured out on the earth, it then cites the Song of Moses. Now, which Song of Moses? Uh, I could say, you know, what about the songs of Lennon and McCartney? There's a whole bunch, right? You know, if I just said Lennon and McCartney, am I talking about Love Me Do? Am I talking about I Want to Hold Your Hand? Am I talking about Let It Be? I mean, what am I talking about? So Moses has another famous song in Exodus 15. The interesting thing is the part that's quoted in Revelation 15 quotes Exodus 15, but it also quotes Deuteronomy 32. And God here is going back, if you will, to Moses' greatest hits and saying, this is what I was talking about all the way back then, my redemption for my people and my redemption even for this planet that I'm going to bring my purposes to pass, that I am a God who's going to save, who's going to establish my glory and show my holiness, and I'm going to judge evil. And that's what Moses was singing about back in Exodus 15 and also in Deuteronomy 32, which brings us to the song. Verse 1, Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Now there's that phrase again. And we already read it in his prelude back in verse 28. I call heaven and earth to witness against them, he said. Now he sings, give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as rain drops on the tender herb, and as showers on the grass. Now that's a beginning that isn't very daunting. In fact, it's rather pleasant. There's the idea of the verdant growth of dew and rain falling on the plants and everything being green and lush. Now, if you're from Thailand or Vietnam or even this part of New York, that's not that impressive because everything's green around you, right? But if you're from Israel, if you're actually on the east side of the Jordan River standing in what we call today the nation of Jordan, then it's more brown. It's more dry. To see something green and lush, that's beautiful. So it starts out with the fact that his song isn't going to be all a diatribe or a Jeremiah or just calling down condemnation. For he says, verse 3, I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without, un without injustice, righteous and upright is he. So Moses starts with God. Let's talk about the Lord. The reason we have all these commands and statutes and judgments is because this is who God is. He's a rock. It's that statement of stability, of God being our fortress, a place of protection, Somebody who doesn't move, someone you can anchor to, someone who can be your shelter in the storm. One of our hymns was at Elizabeth C. Cuffane, 
who wrote uh, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. She said, a shadow of a weary rock within, no, I'm sorry, a shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land. And this is our God. He's the rock. He's the one we can stand on. He gives us a place to stand. He gives us security. And so we say, it says his work is perfect. All his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. That's what he's been driving at all through this book. God wants you to follow him. God wants to, you to obey him. Why? Because he's a just and a fair God, a God who does the right thing and who wants to do right by us. But what about humanity? He says, verse 5, they have corrupted themselves. They are not his children because of their blemish, a perverse and crooked generation. Now, one more time, I go to the Ryan file, and I bid you turn to Philippians 2 and see how this phrase comes up in the New Testament. I wasn't kidding at the beginning of the week when I said, that the rest of scripture just keeps hearkening back over and over again to Philippians. And there's a lot more than what we've seen this week. Philippians chapter 2. And he says there in verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Now, where could we think of a people in history who've been complaining and disputing? Well, that really reminds me of Israel in the wilderness. That you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault. Now, he says in the song, they are not children, they are corrupt. They're not behaving like God's children, in other words. But in growing in our sanctification, in our likeness to Christ, Philippians says that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And this is what he says here in Deuteronomy 32.5, a perverse and crooked generation. Well, here we are in the world, and we're surrounded by a crooked and perverse generation. But the Lord calls us to be different. And in order to be different, we need salvation. And we need the Lord of the work in us, the, the work of the Lord in us and through us, that we might become those children of God that are blameless and harmless. Now he goes on to say, Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders, and they will tell you. So don't have historical amnesia. Remember back to what the Lord did for you. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. And it's so interesting that that name Jacob, as I think I mentioned before, connotes weakness in the sense that Jacob is the name of trickery, of being a supplanter. This is Jacob in the flesh. This is when he was trying to get the right things by his own way. He's going to be known later as Israel, the prince with God. But it's interesting how often God comes back and says, I know you're Jacob. <laughs> Even on your best days, you're still Jacob. You can still be tricky and wily and not do the right thing. But I'm your God. And I can work even with the weak, the foolish, the powerless thing that you are. And he says, Jacob is the place of his inheritance. You say, why would he want Jacob? Well, we could say the same. Why would he want us? Verse 10, he found him in a desert land, in the wasteland, the howling wilderness. He encircled him. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Now, later, Psalm 17, I think it's verse 8, is going to be use that phrase. The apple of the eye. I think in Spanish they call it the little girl of the eye. Because it almost looks like you can look into someone's eye 
and see a little person there, right? Now you think about that pupil, that little part in your pupil, in your eye there, where you can see that reflection, and that's a very tender part of your eye. I mean, I can actually, I'm not gonna do it, my contact lens will fall out, but I can put my hand on the white of my eye, if I'm not going like that, like the Three Stooges, I can just put my finger right on the white of my eye, no problem. But to put it in the center of my eye, I can only do that for like an instant. I mean, if something comes at my eye, and when I go to the ophthalmologist, they bring in this thing to check my eye pressure. You know, they want to yeah. see if you have glaucoma. And they have like this pen. And when you're standing there, look straight ahead, they say, and this pen's coming at you. And in your mind, it looks like an intercontinental ballistic missile. You know, it looks like Norman Bates is there with the butcher knife ready to just shove it in your eye. You want to recoil, and many times I have. And sometimes the nurse is holding me on one side, and they got, now, I mean, an injection, I don't mind. Even having things cut out of my flesh, I've had, and I don't flinch. But you start coming at that part of your eye, and I'm like, whoa, you know? And he says, that's how precious you're, that tender part of my, my eye to me. That's the phraseology he uses of Israel. He goes on to talk about his care for them and saying in verse 11 about an eagle, as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. So the Lord alone led him and there was no foreign God with him. And he's saying, remember, it wasn't any other God that took you out of Egypt and that led you through the wilderness that took care of you. I was like the mother eagle taking care of its eaglets. My kids and I and Naomi, we all got to watch on a webcam an eagle's nest in Decorah, Iowa, back in the springtime. My mother-in-law tipped us off that there was an eagle sitting up there on the eggs and that they were about ready to hatch. And we watched that different times. We'd tune in between school sessions. And eventually, sure enough, we tuned in, and there's the mother eagle hovering over the eaglets. And then by and by, we saw the father uh, bringing some fish or something out of the river up to these little babies. And just the, the protection and the covering of them. And this is the imagery he uses here. Verse 13, he made him ride in the heights of the earth that he might eat the produce of the fields. He made them draw honey from the rock and oil from the flinty rock herds from the cattle and milk of the flock with fat of the lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan. Bashan or Bashan is the modern area we call the Golan Heights in northeastern Israel. And it was an area of great cattle and goats and sheep back in those days. He speaks about the choicest wheat in verse 14. In Hebrew, it's the idea of the, fat, the fattest of the wheat. Actually, Psalm 81 there's another cross-reference here. It's going to refer back to this passage. Go over with me a moment to Psalm 81, please. Psalm 81 and verse 8. This is almost language that you'd expect to hear in Deuteronomy. Look how it starts. Here, O oh my people. And I will admonish you. You've noticed how often God tells Israel to hear. O oh Israel, if you will listen to me, there shall be no foreign God among you, nor shall you worship any foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Like that mother bird or that father bird bringing food to the babies. The Lord says, open your mouth wide and I'll fill it. That was incidentally one of George Mueller's favorite verses. But my people would not heed my voice. So here's God wanting to take care of them, wanting to feed them, and they won't listen. Israel would have none of me, so I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. Verse 13, oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord would pretend submission to him but their fate would endure forever. He would have fed them also, and here's the same phrase we just read in Deuteronomy, with the finest of the wheat. It's literally the fatness of the wheat. And with honey from the rock, I would have satisfied you. So here the psalmist, one song 
is quoting another and going back and talking about how God wanted to bless them, how he took care of them. And here in Deuteronomy, he's describing it as how he had already behaved toward the nation. But what was the response? Verse 15. But Jeshurun, and that's probably a play on the name of Israel because the two words start out the same in Hebrew. But Jeshurun means upright one. Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. So in their prosperity, just as we noted early in the book, when he said, now when you come into the land and you eat and you get all these wonderful things, don't forget the Lord. And this is exactly what they had done in the past. He grew fat and he kicked. He grew fat, you grew thick, you are obese. Then he forsook God and made him and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God. To gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. Of the rock who begot you, you're unmindful and you have forgotten the God who fathered you. I think it's in Isaiah 51 or it may be the beginning of 52 that he tells them to look unto the rock whence they're hewn. Go back to the foundation. Think about the Lord being your rock and think about how he started with Abraham and the promises he made. Wasn't these false things you're calling gods, which are really demons? And 1 Corinthians made the same point, that behind, behind idols are demons. That the idol itself is nothing, it's an empty vanity, but demons exploit that. When people worship idols, demons are behind that and using that and leading people away from God. And so... Seeing all this, the Lord said in verse 20, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be. For they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faith. They have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. But I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. And again, Romans is going to quote this part of Deuteronomy in chapter 10. For a fire is kindled in my anger, and shall burn to the lowest hell, and it shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap disasters on them, I will spend my arrows on them. They shall be wasted with hunger, devoured by pestilence, and bitter destruction. I will also send against them the teeth of beasts. With the poison of serpents of the dust, the sword shall destroy outside, there shall be terror within for the young man and virgin, the nursing child, and the man of gray hairs. I would have said, I will dash them in pieces. I will make the memory of them to cease from among men. Had I not feared the wrath of their enemy, lest their adversaries should misunderstand, lest they should say, our hand is high, and it is not the Lord who has done all this. Now, do you notice that rationale? He says, now, really, I would have fully wiped them out, except that the unbelieving nations would think that it was them doing it. And tell me, how was it that Moses interceded for Israel up on Mount Horeb? When Israel sinned and God said, Moses, I'll wipe them out and I'll start over with you. I'll make of you a great nation. Moses said, don't do that, Lord, because the nations will say it's because you hated them and couldn't bring them into the land. Remember your testimony to the nations. Now, that very same way Moses prayed, it shows his understanding of God. And God actually argues this way and says, you know what? I might have been inclined to really wipe you out with them, but I didn't do it because I remember what the nations would say about me. And I'm faithful to my word. It's not that God's capricious or that he, in some kind of simplistic way, cares about his reputation. But on the other hand, He's going to be true to himself. The second Timothy 2 says he cannot deny himself. But Israel says there, in verse 28, he says of Israel, they are a nation void of counsel, nor is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they would understand this, that they would consider their latter end. How could one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight unless the rock had sold them and the Lord surrendered them? This is what the Lord had told them. Just a few chapters ago, we saw, if you're obedient, you're going to be the ones who are chasing the thousands, right? If you're disobedient, those thousands are going to chase you. God's saying, if they only thought through 
what I said to them and why this is happening to them now. It would be because I've obviously given them over to this. For he says, verse 31, their rock is not like our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gold, their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of serpents and the cool venom of cobras. That's the generation that deserves this judgment. They're being described like Sodom and Gomorrah. And Isaiah is going to use that same language of Israel. He says, is this not laid up in store with me? Verse 34, sealed up among my treasures. Vengeance is mine in recompense, which you probably recognize from Romans 12 to name one place. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. For the Lord will judge his people. Now I believe when he's talking about the vengeance, he's referring to these nations that are attacking them. Because then he turns to the Lord will judge his people. Now, when we talk about the Lord will judge his people, we think of negative judgment. We think, oh, God's going to come and punish them for what they've done. But so often in the Psalms, you get this language that the psalmist says, judge me, O Lord, in my righteousness. And really what it is, is a call for justice. It's saying, God, look at my situation and see how I'm suffering injustice, how I'm being oppressed. And really, even though I'm a sinner and I, and I, I am not meritoriously asking for this, I don't deserve what I'm getting from my fellow man. They're treating me badly. They're doing things they shouldn't do. And even these nations that don't trust in the rock of the Lord, they trust in these other rocks that are false. And God says, I'm going to judge them. Just like he tells Habakkuk, I'm going to use Babylon to chasten Israel. But then Babylon turns around and gives the glory to their idols. And so God says, I'm going to judge them. No, he says here, he will have compassion on his servants in verse 36 when he sees that their power is gone and that there's no one remaining bond or free. He will say, where are their gods, the rock in which they sought refuge, who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink and offering? Let them rise and help you and be your refuge. Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. For I raise my hand to heaven and say, as I live forever, if I wet my glittering sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh. With the blood of the slain and the captives from the heads of the leaders of the enemies. Now, again, the Lord is saying there, I'm waiting till this people comes to an end of themselves. I'm waiting till they're naked and they don't have anything. And it's become obvious that the gods that they had trusted in, these false gods, that they're empty and futile and can't save. And that's the very time I'm going to come in and I'm going to judge their enemies. And then he says something that you'd almost think was New Testament. And it's quoted in Romans 15. Verse 43, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. For he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries and he will provide atonement for his land and his people now there are parts of that song that are very hard to take like a lot of deuteronomy i don't enjoy reading about the curses i don't enjoy reading about the terrible consequences of sin and the retributive justice that comes upon people for their departure from the lord but at the end, the Lord says, you know what, in spite of all this sin and me letting this people go down, 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 it is going to have its limit. I'm going to step in and I'm going to judge those who oppress them. And I'm going to deal with the wicked nations of the earth. And we know from New Testament revelation that he's ultimately going to wipe out evil from the earth. And the intriguing thing in Revelation it's not just that God judges the world, we would expect that, but it's also this idea that the judgment of God is so beautiful that throughout Revelation, we see heaven opening 
And we see these beautiful things in heaven, the beautiful throne of God in Revelation 4 and 5, for example. And the angels, as they're coming forth to pour out the judgment, they're glorious beings. And they've got golden bowls, don't they? Beautiful. And this is what the psalmist meant when they talked about worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Man thinks of holiness as something negative, and he thinks of judgment as just something bad. But if you're oppressed, if you're persecuted, if you're suffering, you think that judgment is good. You rejoice to see the evil who have not repented, who have not changed their mind about what they've done, who if they had the power would go on and do it again, you rejoice to see them brought to justice and not get away with it. And you rejoice to see the Lord vindicated and elevated above everything. And when the Lord does this, it has absolutely global implications because this is not just for Israel. He says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And like we've said so many times this week, this is not just salvation for Israel, but this is salvation for Israel that the Gentiles might come. Exactly what Brother Rich was telling us earlier. That the Gentiles might say, look at their God. We look at all these other false gods, and he's knocked them all down. They've all been judged. In Revelation, people throw those, actually in Isaiah, people throw those images into the caves and into the places where the bats and the moles live. And Revelation 6 refers to that, and that's where they cry out for the mountains to fall on them and to hide them. But the Lord is exalted in glory. One moment, Brother Michael, I'll just, uh, Brother Michael, I'll get to you in a second. And that ending refrain there in the last phrase of verse 43, he will provide atonement for his land and his people. Now, he could have said he will pour out wrath on the land and the people. And after all the things that Moses said they're going to do, and after all the things they had already done, we'd say he'd have every right as a God of justice to do that. But God's also a God of mercy and a God of grace. And so he ends with that word of salvation. And indeed, it's a stark warning to Israel. I can imagine many an individual Israelite in the subsequent centuries when they were tempted toward idolatry, they'd think back to Moses' song, and they'd say, no, there's nothing there. I shouldn't look to those false gods, because they're not like our rock. Our rock, he's the Lord, and he's going to judge his adversaries, and he's going to provide atonement for his land and his people. So however we may fail, the Lord is going to have the victory, and I'm going to trust in him. Brother Mike? That's right. Right, right. Yes, that's right, brother. Amen. That's right. Then he, you alluded to in Revelation. Um, in Revelation 15, 3, it mentions after the song of Moses. Yes, sir. It says, Then they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of Saints. Mm -hmm. And that imply the very song that you just read? And yes, I believe it is. It, it does seem to have some reference. Some of the things that are said are also phrases in Exodus 15. So I think both are in mind. That they can think back to God redeeming them out of Egypt, but also think back to what Moses is talking about here in Psalm. In, um, keep wanting to say Psalm. In Deuteronomy 32, this Psalm of Moses. So absolutely, brother. Amen. Thank you. The mantle of Ryan has fallen upon you. So that's good. <laughs> it's amazing God we have, right? Amen. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal. Mm. <laughs> Amen, brother. Well, other contributions or questions for this evening? Um, Yes, sir. Go ahead, please. Can we conclude by saying then that it seems like 
There were times when there was a lot more, um, you know, their history is not all disobedience. Like there were times of revival when Hezekiah, for example, brings large groups of them back to celebrate the Passover and they, they actually tear down a lot of the idolatrous shrines and so forth. And certainly in Josiah's day, it was the same way. And even in the time of the judges, as bad as it is in the judges, that every man's doing what is right in his own eyes. You still have these individual godly people that you meet throughout the book. So, I'd put it this way. A brother that I learned a lot from the Bible growing up used to say, there's always a remnant. You know, a remnant is a smaller group, okay, than the whole. It's a subset of the whole. Maybe we might say the minority. But there's never been a time in Israel's history when it was absolute darkness and everybody was rebellious. There was always someone. There were always Hannah in 1 Samuel 1 and her son Samuel. There were always were people like Noah and his wife who became Samson's parents. There were always people like Gideon and Jephthah and, and different people like that. And you can go to some of the kings and see some of them that were good, as well as, as you said, the prophets that pop up with regularity in the Bible. So there were godly people that feared the Lord, but it was very often a small minority. And even when our Lord Jesus came to earth, that's kind of the interesting thing that uh, the Lord Jesus came when the, when the wise men came rather, and they approached Herod in Matthew two and said, where is he who's born king of the Jews? I think it makes the statement in that chapter something to the effect that all Jerusalem was troubled, but who actually went out to try and find the Lord, you know, to try and worship the Lord? It was only the wise men at that point. The Lord was just a toddler, apparently. He was a young child in a house. And earlier at his birth, who was it that went to worship the Lord? It was the shepherds. And later when he's presented in the temple, it's Anna, it's Simeon. It's a few people. But think of the thousands and thousands of people that were around there that were absolutely oblivious that all these prophecies were being fulfilled right there in their midst because they weren't looking for Messiah. They weren't living with any interest in him coming because if they were, I'm sure the Lord would have told them like he told Simeon, you're not gonna die before you see Messiah, Simeon. So, uh, well, Simeon is the one who takes up the child when Joseph and Mary bring him into the temple and Simeon says, now, Lord, let your servant depart in peace. I've seen your, salva your salvation, the glory of the Gentiles and the light of your people, Israel. Zechariah or Zacharias, that's John the Baptist's father. So he would be in that same group that we're looking for Messiah. You're right. At the end of Luke 1, we get his wonderful song about Messiah. But it was still a, a remnant. It was still a small, comparatively small group of people that were looking for him. And even after his ministry, at the beginning of the book of Acts, it's still a pretty small remnant. And it gets bigger uh, in a hurry as the Holy Spirit comes. But so much of their history was rebellious, and yet the light was never totally extinguished. There were always believers. There, were, there was always a remnant. So. And even Jesus' family, right? Yes, that's right. didn't become believers until later. You're right. Which, I mean, how could that be possible? It just shows you... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the blindness the Prince of Power there has. And, uh, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were believers, but it seems like they believe God. Well, he's referring to the half brothers who, in John 7, they tell the Lord to go up to the feast, and John explains, for neither did they believe in Jesus. They, they tell him to go up to the feast because they're thinking, if you're trying to be somebody and, and be famous and get a movement together, you better go up and meet the people and shake hands and, you know, do some miracles so people follow you. But John says they didn't really believe in the Lord. In other words, they didn't understand that he was the Christ, the Son of God. 
But as Brian said, later, we know 1 Corinthians 15 says he appeared unto James. And he's not talking about the son of Zebedee, one of the 12. He's not talking about James the less. He's talking about James, the half-brother of the Lord. And James becomes a believer. He's very outspoken in Acts 15. Same thing with Jude, who wrote the letter of Jude. We think he's probably the half-brother of the Lord. That was named Jude, or Judas is, is the name, or Judah, if you take the Hebrew form. Somebody was something about the big temple that was directed to his mother and his father. Well, no, they believe. Yeah, yeah, because the Lord sent them an angel. Joseph believed what he said. Mary believed, and it even says Mary stored up in her heart the things concerning the Lord. So absolutely, if we're talking to his parents, they were believers. And we're talking their relatives, Elizabeth and Zechariah, who were, I guess, related to Mary. They're called, Elizabeth's called Mary's kinswoman. They believe. But if we're talking his half-brothers, we know by John 7, they didn't believe, at least then. It seems that after the resurrection is when they believe. Good. Other comments or questions? I thought of uh, in Matthew um, 23, verse 27, people said, No Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, and the hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. In see, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Amen. So just the, the heart, the heart of God has to change. Amen. Yeah, that love of the Lord and that image, very similar to the language of this song of Moses about the mother hen protecting the chicks. That's lovely. Thank you. Yes, brother Keith. There's just one verse. Yeah, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. They had I think disobedience, I know. <laughs> unbelief, and then it's the same here. The Lord has not given you years to yeah. I never noticed that person. I didn't either, to be honest with you. So, Isn't it kind of the aspect of hardening the heart? Like that first man himself hardens his own heart, and then God hardens it. It's like a step-by-step -step process. It's, just, it's not like at first you didn't give him a heart to see this. He gives all men light at first. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it's a step towards the wrong way if they don't first receive the light. Yeah, that could be so. My uh, brother Rich? So much of a faith, but I had a little faith in me. Maybe that exercise a little faith. And have a little faith, the Lord said you can have more good. Okay. Because there is some faith there to work on. Right. So that's more a statement of the progress of their understanding. Yeah. They've got a little light that they can get more light. That could be so. Yeah. They saw all these signs and great wonders, yet they were still rebellious. So the Lord knows their hearts. So it's right. a judicial thing. Yeah, that could very well be, brethren, but I freely admit I don't know, and I, I hadn't noticed it before, so I'll have to look into that, and maybe I'll be able to get maybe I'll be able to get back to you on that tomorrow, but maybe I won't. I don't know. I don't know if I'll find any enlightenment on it tonight, but it could be that those are. I will say that what the brethren have suggested are all plausible suggestions. So. 
where Isaiah 6, uh -huh. 9 and 10, he said, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not yeah. see, keep on looking, but do not understand, render the hearts of these people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand what the hearts of the country reveal. That sounds like a Matthew chapter 12. Also. Yeah, it's quoted, that's that verse I was referring to earlier. That's quoted, I think, four times in the Bible, and right. you get it too. Yeah, it's Acts 28. It's also John 12, and Matthew, and I think Isaiah is the fourth thing. So yeah, that it would go to Kevin's point of judicial hardening, you know, based on what they had done. But it seems like a weird place to have it. In not that I'm criticizing God's word, but I, I'm struggling to follow the flow of thought in Deuteronomy 29. So, but it could very well be that, brother. I'm not saying it isn't. And obviously some of the Bible translations think that because the New King James gives that cross-reference as well. You're a good gold miner there, buddy. <laughs> yeah. So I knew somewhere along the line we'd hit some stuff where I'd have to say I don't know, and so uh, thank oh, you. I Thanks for bringing that up. We'll we'll dig into that. Well, on the uh, subject, there was something else you didn't know today. I'll tell you. Okay, please do. Nick Vanell hit 305 in 1998. Oh, thank you, thank you. Good. <laughs> Very good, brother. Pretty good actor. That's good. <laughs> well, if it, if there are any Yankee fans here, my great uncle was a relief pitcher. For the 1929, 1930, and 1931 Yankees, yeah. which made him a teammate of Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. And so you can read about him in the baseball encyclopedia. His arm gave out, he had to have surgery, and in those days that was it. So he was, his name was Roy Sherid, S H E R I D. He was married to my grandmother's sister. And I knew him. Uh, a little bit as a small child. He would never talk about baseball. I mean, he might listen to a game, but he wouldn't talk about his experience in baseball. He was bitter about it, as I understand. And the irony is, when he was an older man, he died of Lou Gehrig's disease. So I remember visiting him. I remember him coming to my grandmother's house, grandparents' house. And I also remember him later in the hospital when he was dying, going to visit him there as a little boy. But the interesting thing is uh, the family, some of his grandsons and granddaughters were believers, and at least one of them became a quote-unquote Baptist pastor, and he uh, led him to the Lord, it seems, on his deathbed. Oh, wow. So we are very thankful that uh, he died, but that we expect we'll see him again when he's with the Lord. So anyway, that's my little footnote on the Yankees. But... <laughs> Yeah, he was long gone before Mantle came up. But thanks for the 305 in 1958. That's <laughs> okay, brethren. Well, we've had a good week. I'm so thankful to the Lord. I'm so thankful to you all. You've obviously put a lot into this study, uh, both before you came and by your prayers and also your contributions. And I've been edified. I've been helped by things you've shared. And so I'm grateful for that and trust the Lord to give me a good rest so that we can have one more session in the morning, Lord willing, that will uh, send us off on the right note, I hope. And we can rejoice in our God who is so faithful. Uh, yes, Brother Keith. I just want to say that uh, those of us who are here, I mean, I don't know how much we love these studies. And over the years, I don't know, maybe 15 years, I've been coming everywhere. This 